Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. I'm so glad that you've tuned in to this broadcast today. Today it's December the 13th, 2020. We're not able to meet in our regular uh, service today. So all of us are at home listening to the broadcast online. I'm broadcasting from my own home. And uh, I'm just really happy that you're able to join me today. I know that God has something special in store for each of you as you turn to the Word and as you follow along with me as we continue our exploration into the book of First Peter. For those who are new, welcome. Um, we are in the middle of a sermon series in the book of First Peter, and we're looking at First Peter chapter 3, verses 9 to 11, which is my text this morning. Would you bow with me in prayer as we start? Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you that there's people that have tuned into this broadcast, God, that I know you desire to speak to. And I pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would take the word that is, um, is here and would encourage and would strengthen and would teach those that are listening today. God, for those that are struggling, I pray, God, that you would help them and that you would give them your grace to understand what it is that your spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this morning, all of us have experienced times in our lives where things are done to us that just aren't right. As a matter of fact, sometimes people do stuff to us that's just plain evil. Prayerfully, evil or hurtful behavior towards us does not come from other Christians, but the reality is, is that sometimes it does. It is often well-meaning people that become a conduit for uh, wrong thinking and acting because they're not walking in step with the Holy Spirit and they're not following the principles laid down in the Word of God. Now, this morning I, I want to talk to you about a better way of dealing with insult and with evil that people speak to, to us speak into us. Now, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil, or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you are called, so that you may inherit a blessing. So when we look at this scripture verse, the first thing that we see is the inevitability that we are going to suffer from evil behavior directed at us from other people that Insult will definitely come to us. If it hasn't come to us, it will come to us. I'm sure most people that are here would readily recognize that they have been targeted by evil behavior or insults um, in their past. Now the question is, how do I respond when someone tries to hurt or destroy me or hurt or destroy those that are closest to me? And with every response to hardship, whether brought on by people inside of the church or by people that are outside of the church in the world, we need to learn to have a righteous response. I believe God wants us to have a righteous response. We need to learn how to respond to evil or insult in a way that pleases Jesus. And when the Apostle Peter first started following Jesus, he himself had to learn the lessons associated to this question firsthand from the Master himself. In the beginning, Peter got it wrong. But by the time Peter wrote his epistles, he had a, learned a great lesson that ended up changing his behavior and his entire future. Let's take a look at Peter and his journey of spiritual growth in handling injustice. Now, Peter walked very closely with Jesus for three years. Now, towards the end of Christ's life, after the Last Supper, Jesus turned his gaze towards Peter and said this in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 34. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Now picture the scene. 
the disciples are all together reclining at a table. And Jesus has just finished identifying his betrayer. He identified Judas as betrayer. And the disciples have just taken the very first communion. And Jesus, he directs his attention to Peter. Jesus tells Peter that his faith is going to fail and that he will deny him. He also tells Peter that once he is restored, he should strengthen his brothers. Peter protests. He does not want to deny Jesus. He wants to fight to defend Jesus. He wants to defight his honor and his kingdom. Now, it's never easy to admit that we have an attitude problem, is it? Or that God wants us to deal with an issue deep inside of us. When God puts his hand on us and advises us that we need to grow and change our way of thinking, we may have a hard time seeing it and admitting it. What Jesus was saying to Peter in these verses, he was saying that Peter was going to be tested, he was going to be sifted, and that Peter is going to have to learn an important lesson And that after he learns from his experience, he is to take what he learns and he is to strengthen his brothers. So what is this lesson that Jesus needed to teach him? Let's fast forward past the Last Supper scene and go to the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 18. Now we know that Jesus and his disciples had gone to the Garden and Jesus was praying. The disciples had fallen fast asleep. And let's go to that scene in John 18 where Judas, the Lord's betrayer, and the religious authorities came to arrest Jesus. And we see this in verse 7, starting in verse 7, Jesus is speaking, speaking to those that come to arrest him. Again he asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, Then let these men go. This happened to fulfill the words that had spoken that would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. So we see Peter, Peter the fisherman, aggressive Peter, eager to prove his loyalty to his Lord and to prove Jesus wrong. He drew out his sword that he was carrying and he struck the high priest's servant cutting off his right ear. You can imagine that every fabric of Peter uh, was screaming out, "You, you can't do this. No, I will not allow this evil. How dare you attack us? How dare you come at us? How dare you try to take away my Lord? God, I will fight for you. Jesus, I will fight for you. You will not hurt my Lord. His people or his kingdom, slice goes the sword. We'll preserve our Lord's kingdom and his freedom to the death if necessary. That was Peter's demeanor. In his own strength, Peter sought to be true to his word and to his calling to be devoted to Jesus. He was trying to defend Jesus Christ, his honor, and his kingdom. Was Peter's fierce loyalty commendable? How did Jesus respond to Peter lifting the sword against the enemies of his kingdom? Jesus commanded Peter to put away the sword. In Matthew 26, verses 52 and 53, Jesus said to Peter, For all who live by the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot call on my Father and He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? You see, in Peter's mind, he was doing what was right. He was defending the Lord and the Lord's kingdom. But Jesus made it clear that Peter was doing it the wrong way. That his kingdom and his honor were not to be defended with the sword. Jesus also made Uh, it clear Peter's view of the circumstance was not accurate at all. Jesus was not at the will and the whim of those who were coming at him. 
Jesus was not unable to defend himself and his kingdom. Jesus did not need Peter to bear arms to defend him with his own physical strength. As a matter of fact, Jesus could say the word and more than 12 legions of angels would be immediately dispatched from the Father God to crush his enemies. But you see, Jesus had a different plan. Another plan. A plan that did not make sense to Peter. In Luke's account in chapter 22, verses 51 to 53, after Peter had cut off the high priest's servant's ear, Jesus turned his gaze towards Peter and said, No more of this. And then he proceeded to pick up the ear that was severed and heal the injured man's ear. Not only did Jesus stop Peter from continuing to defend him with his own physical strength in a way that made sense to him, Jesus cleaned up the mess that Peter had made when he tried to defend the Lord's kingdom on his own terms. Jesus had compassion on the high priest's servant and healed his ear, knowing full well that it was the high priest's servant who would soon be arresting him and leading him to trial and ultimately to the pain of the cross. In verse 53, Jesus then advised those who are arresting him, This is your hour when darkness reigns. There are times, my friends, where God allows darkness to reign so that light will shine even brighter. This does not make sense in our flesh. We don't like it. When evil comes at us, We want to take the sword in hand and defend the Lord, His kingdom, and the liberty He has permitted us to experience when we walk with Him. But there are times, however, when God permits evil to have its way in this world. The natural man does not understand this. But I pray that God would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say about all of this. As believers, some of us are tempted to do the same thing as Peter. When we see evil approaching us to take away our liberty or the liberty of the church, we react. Some of us react by taking the proverbial sword in hand to strike out at those who are perceiving, who are, we, are, we are perceiving may be employed by the ones who are plotting to destroy us. What does the Lord say about this attitude? He does not commend it nor does he approve of the actions which come from it. Jesus' actions show an example of compassion on those who are carrying out the orders of the spiritual forces of darkness without even knowing what they are doing. Remember at the cross where Jesus cried out, Forgive them, for they know not what they do? He had compassion on even those who were going to take his life. Peter in his own impulsivity would have just left the high priest servant bleeding and likely he would have taken another swing. Revolution for the Messiah. All those for the Messiah take up arms and fight for the king and for his kingdom. But Jesus had another plan. Jesus had compassion on the high priest servant. Jesus also permitted darkness to reign for a time so that his sovereign purposes might be accomplished in the end. Are we not glad that Jesus did what he did in humbling himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross? For without going to the cross, we would all be lost. And after Jesus rose from the grave and appeared to the disciples, one of the first things he did was to restore Peter. I would like to read for you the story of Peter's restitution in John chapter 21 because I really believe that it practically applies to what Peter needed to learn from Jesus prior to to having him minister effectively in the kingdom of God. Starting with verse 15 and 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he says, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger and dressed yourself and, and went where you, you went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Jesus knew the struggle that Peter had. Peter wanted to serve the Lord. He recognized the Lord for being who he was, but Peter was used to dealing with things the direct way. Direct threat, direct resistance. You dare attack the ones I love, you had better be prepared to meet the cold steel of my sword. But this kind of strength is fleshly, and when it comes down to it, what we try to do in our own strength to defend the Lord and His kingdom in this realm, in this way, will result in a sword back on us. Peter had to submit what he thought was best and learn the Lord's way of establishing and maintaining His kingdom. In restoration, what Jesus did here was ask Peter if he loved Him. If the answer was yes, then Peter needed to spend time caring for and feeding the flock of God rather than spending time fighting against the enemies of his kingdom. My friends, do you see the parallel? Jesus did not promise Peter that it would be easy for him here on the earth. Jesus didn't tell Peter that he would enjoy being treated wrongly and slandered. This is why he used this parallel of a young person who could go where he wanted and do what he pleased, and the old person who was forced in his old age to be led around to go places where he does not want to go. Peter would be led into circumstances that in his flesh he would not like. Nevertheless, this was God's purpose for him, and ultimately God had a glorious unseen purpose in it all. Was it cruel and unusual punishment that Jesus did not promise Peter wealth health and prosperity? No, Jesus promised that Peter's suffering would result in the glory and praise to God in a way that if he didn't suffer, it would not. In the end, there would be an external reward that far outweighed the suffering experienced here on the earth. An eternal reward, I should say, not external. Remember what Peter said in the beginning of this book in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 7. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. My friends, we are no different than Peter. We're human and subject to the same feelings, frustrations, and temptations that he was. In character, some of us are more like Peter than others, but we would do well to pay attention to Peter's life and the lessons that he learned from Jesus. In in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle continues, when we or the other people in our lives that we love are dished out what we see as evil, evil behavior from men. These men are obviously influenced by the powers of darkness. How does Peter call us to respond? He says in verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. When treated unfairly, unjustly, or wickedly, our flesh, we want, we want vengeance. We want to strike back, but... This is not God's way. 
For he knows in doing so, we will only make things worse. Remember the one who is encouraging us not to repay evil with evil or insult with insult? This is the same Peter who drew the sword and swung at what he thought threatened Jesus Christ and his kingdom prior to learning what God wanted him to learn about the whole thing. But what about injustice? What about freedom? What about our liberties? Peter was not the only one to weigh in on this. The Apostle Paul also weighs in. Paul speaks to this issue in Romans 12, 8-19 when he says, 18-19 when he says, If it is possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There is a theologian named John Stott, and he spoke to this verse and says this, It will be seen that Paul's prohibition of vengeance is not because retribution in itself is wrong, but because it is the prerogative of God, not of man. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Jesus was not prohibiting the administration of justice, but rather forbidding us to take the law into our own hands. The Apostle Peter says, rather than venting anger towards the people who threaten our liberties, on the contrary, repay evil with a blessing, because to this you are called, so that you may inherit a blessing. This comment by Peter is a contradiction on how our flesh desires to equalize the playing field by lashing out. Peter is basically telling us that his former attitudes and actions in defending Christ and his community of disciples from the evil that was attacking them was blatantly wrong and that there is a better way. Peter promises that if we respond to other people who treat us badly with a blessing rather than a curse, we will inherit a blessing. This blessing may mean eternal life that we've already been promised, or more likely, this blessing points to additional rewards from God in this life as well. And that is why Peter continues in verses 10 and 11 saying, For whoever would love life and desire and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. To love life in the midst of trials is a deliberate act of the will and is honoring to the Lord for it expresses an attitude of faith in God. It demonstrates a spirit of trust in Him that He is in control and will work all things together for the good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Peter expanded on this advice to love the life that God graciously has given to us and to make the most of the time that we have on earth by faith with thanksgiving, by commending us to keep our tongue from speaking evil evil, and our lips from telling lies. Too often the problems of life are the result of our having a wrong attitude towards our circumstances, are they not? Or towards strangers, or towards acquaintances, and even towards God. As a result, hasty, sin-laden words and complaining speech is often the consequence of this wrong spirit. So then... Let us follow the example of Peter by humbly bowing ourselves before God and asking Him to fill us with His patience and with His wisdom and to, and to give us faith to make the most of life that has been given to us. We can choose to have a gracious attitude, a thankful heart, and a conversation that is filled with grace and seasoned with salt, with which edifies and encourages other people to the glory of God, and that shows a world that we have the answer that they are looking for. The answer is to have an abundant life here on the earth and for all of eternity in a living relationship with God, 
a closeness that is only made possible by the sacrificial work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Would you follow me as I follow Christ? That's what Paul says. And Peter, in his statement here, is saying, would you learn from me that God has things under his control and that we need to submit ourselves to him and that we do not need to take the sword in hand as our flesh would want us to. But there is a better way. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, I thank you for each person that's here today that has heard this message. I pray, God, that you would just encourage those that are here to follow you with everything that they are and that they would all have a wonderful week as they reflect on the things that you're speaking to them today. And I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.